Well, good morning. Welcome to Chess Base Workshop. My name is Steve Lopez. I'm your host. Thank you for clicking on the link and joining us. It is morning here. Please forgive me if I pause occasionally to have a sip of coffee. I'm still waking up trying to get my heart started here. But uh, what I want to talk about in this Chess Base Workshop and, the, and a couple that will follow is probably the single most important feature of any software that we offer. Hopefully I got your attention with that. We call this chess based workshop, and when you think of a workshop, you think of a room full of tools. At least I do, anyway. And one of my old colleagues used to call Chess Base and Fritz your electronic toolkit for your chess improvement. And I truly believe that to be the case. There's, there's lots of electronic tools here, there's lots of things you can use to become a better player. And what I want to look at is absolutely what I think to be the most important one. We're doing an introduction this week, we're going to talk about why this feature is important. I think one of the most important things that can possibly happen to you as a chess player is to have someone critique your play. Have someone tell you, don't do that, do this, to go over a game after, like when you and your opponent play a game and you sit down and you're going over the moves and at one point he says, you know, I think this would have been a little better. This is the move I was actually afraid of seeing. Uh, those post-mortems are very valuable. If you belong to a chess club, uh, at least a better chess club, I belong to a couple that were full of people that I wouldn't hang out with on a dare if it wasn't to play chess with them. But there was one I belonged to. We had, I believe, one master, two experts, and a couple of guys that were just shy of expert level. They were high class A players that were very generous with their time and very generous with their knowledge, and they would help a lot of us. You'd play a game with those fellas, and I didn't sit there and go, Oh, dang, i got to play a master tonight. I looked forward to playing the game because I knew I wasn't going to win it. So you try to give a, as good accounting of yourself as possible, and the fellow would sit there and he would go over your moves with you afterward and give you advice and give you tips. But what really turned it around for me as a chess player was when I got my first computer and had the ability to run analysis of my own games on as many of my own games as I wanted to. Uh, as often as I wanted to, under different parameters, different setups, different conditions. And over time, I began to see patterns emerging in my play where I was messing things up. My openings were fine. I tended to do real well in the opening. Typical American chess player. Plays the opening wonderfully well. As soon as you get in the middle game, not so, not so much. The end, my end games were terrible. My end games were the pits. They were the worst. And what I learned over time, overlooking at a whole bunch of my games, was I needed to study end games. My tactics were generally okay. I might drop a pawn early, but if it was a player of comparable skill level, I'd usually find a way to win it back with maybe a little more later. So I, I wasn't too worried with tactics. I did study tactics problems, but I needed to learn positional chess. I was giving up too many positional concessions. I didn't understand mobility and controlling areas of the board and I needed to study that and end games were huge. I needed to study end games. And the way I learned that stuff was partly from having human players tell me this and partly from having computers tell me this. A lot of it was computers. The single biggest feature in any software we offer is the ability to have a chess engine, Fritz, Ribka, Shredder, any of them, analyze your games afterward. They don't even really have to be your games sometimes. It, sometimes it's very educational to take a, a, a very famous game from the past and uh, say take a Kappa Blanca Alyekin game from their world championship match and have a very strong chess engine analyze the game and compare what the engine says to what was actually played and, and see how they compare and how they contrast. But the big thing is to do your own games. Um, and when I and the way I would learn to use or, or learn end games after finding out from the software that was where a lot of my problems lie. I would go into chess base and and do searches for end games. First, I would read a chapter in a book on say king and pawn endings. There'd be a, a you know a general end game book chapter one king and pawn endings. I would read that chapter, play through the examples. I'd say, gee, I need some more examples. I'd go into chess base, search for king and pawn endings, play through them. If there was a move that I thought looked a little weird, well, that's not what the book said. I could fire up the Fritz engine within chess base and get an opinion on that player's move to see whether he did a good thing or a bad thing. And that was how I learned to play them, how I learned to play very simple end games by using these electronic tools. But what pointed the way for me really was having Fritz 
and other chess engines of the time, analyze my games, and point out where I went wrong. So that's what we're going to look at in the next couple of chess-based workshops, is the two main analysis forms. I'll describe them to you in this chess-based workshop and show them to you to show you the difference. The first one is full analysis, and that's what we're looking at on the screen right now. This is a game that I pulled out of a database. I changed the player name to initials because it is not my intent to embarrass anyone here. I just wanted to have a game that I could use between two relatively unskilled players. Uh, if you look at their rating, you've got one player rated 1174, another rated 1138. So these aren't grandmasters by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you take a look at this game and you see that the uh, chess software has put in, in this case Fritz, the engine that I used, has put in uh, the name of the opening. It's identified the last book move out of the opening book. I use power book by the way. And this is where the first player left book white played b3 which was not a book move. Um, as you look at the analysis you'll notice for example here that this move, this variation is annotated with an annotation symbol. You know, white is better here. Uh, you don't see numbers, you don't see numerical evaluations. What full analysis attempts to do is try to analyze a game the way a human player would do it, like you'd see it in a chess book or a chess magazine. You see symbols, you see uh, a symbol here, better is this particular move rather than this one and you see occasional verbal commentary, very short phrases. You don't get a, a multi-paragraph exegesis on the uh, importance of the isolated deep on or why a pair of rooks on the seventh rank is a good thing or, or whatever it happens to be. You just get little phrases that kind of guide you, that, that kind of tell you what's going on here. The other thing you get too, which I like very much, is you get the, uh, the diacritic marks, the double question marks or the single question mark or uh, in this case you've got the uh, the exclam followed by the question mark. Of course double question mark, very bad move. I hear it in my head as huh when I see that whereas when I see this I hear huh not quite as emphatic. Uh, this one is a hmm uh, interesting move you know uh, uh, exclam followed by a question mark on this particular one. So that's what you get in this game. You get little comments, you get symbolic uh, notation, you get occasional diacritic marks and what you're looking at is a game the way you would see it in a chess book or a chess magazine. It's neat but it doesn't give you a lot of precision. It gives you some general ideas. Whereas if we look at another game, and if you give me a moment we'll go to it here, this is one analyzed with blunder check. Now if you read the chess based literature, the help files and, and various things, uh, you'll find that blunder check was originally intended to be a way for strong players to double check their analysis. Um, I disagree very emphatically with that characterization of this feature. This feature is this is killer. I mean this is absolutely, I use this all the time because not only does it tell me whether a move was better or worse or a variation is better or worse, but it gives me a numerical assessment of how much. Now this looks like a lot of information, it looks very confusing, but there's ways to tweak it where you don't get quite as much numerical information out of it, just the very important stuff. Uh, there's different ways to run this feature and that's what we're going to look at when we talk about blunder check. So don't be overwhelmed by this. It looks like a ton of information, but it's all very, 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 very useful information. I, I, I use this feature all the time. And the reason why I use this feature all the time, and again, I cannot possibly overemphasize this, is the way you become a better chess player is to get feedback. You need to take your games and you need to have them analyzed by a stronger player, whether it's a machine, whether it's a human being. Um, and, and I would be a much, much, much better chess player today if, as a young person, I would have had access to these tools. Back in, uh, I learned to play chess when I was four, but back when I was 12 was when I really got into it. And the reason for that was, and I'm dating myself here, was it was 1972. It was when Bobby Fischer played Boris Spassky for the World Championship. <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody was into chess at that time. And at that time, uh, to give you an idea of how dollar amounts and things have changed, uh, you could buy a Volkswagen Beetle for $2,000. Well, back then, the average chess computer, tabletop chess computer, was about $500. Uh, 
That's about a quarter of the price of a car. Trust me, in my house, we weren't going to be buying a chess computer anytime soon. We had more important things to spend money on uh, rather than my chess playing skills. So I didn't have access to this stuff. I didn't get my first computer until I was in my early 30s. And then I just used this software all the time, and I got a fair bit better fairly quickly. And a lot of it had to do with the analysis features in the Fritz software. And we're going to look at them in the next couple of chess-based workshops. The single, what I think, in my opinion, is the single most important tool. And even at the age of 50, I turned 50 this month, I'll, I'll give it away there. And although I uh, intend on living forever, I believe John Nunn does as well. I think we may have shot some emails back and forth or something about this once. Um, and there are a couple other players I know. We, we don't plan on dying anytime soon. Um, so at age 50, I'm still trying to improve my chess, and I still use this feature very, very, very often. And for my money, this is the most important feature of any of the software programs that we offer. So over the next couple of chess-based workshops, we're going to show you how to use this feature, how to set it up, how to run it, and what your results will look like. And we'll start the next time around in the very next chess-based workshop. Until then, please to have fun.